Hi, welcome to Tear Down Tuesday. Now I actually asked on Twitter what I should actually tear down today. Because, well, I do actually do the tear down on Tuesday here in Australia, not Austria. Now, I had the overwhelming response said, do the Amiga 500. Ta-da! Here it is, the Amiga 500 in all its uh, bromide uh, yellowed glory. About 25 years old. Uh, nine, I'm not sure of the exact vintage of this one, but the Amiga uh, 500, Commodore Amiga 500, was, came out in 1987, discontinued in 1991. So let's round it to a 25 year old vintage computer technology. <sighs> Hope it's better inside than it smells. Let's go. And yes, unfortunately, it does have that old garage smell because that's exactly where I got this sucker from. In fact, I got uh, two of them. They look uh, very similar, except one's got uh, a key missing and uh, one supposedly works and one doesn't. Go figure. Anyway, we'll open this one, which has all the keys intact. And yes, that uh, it, it is turning that classic uh, yellow color as a lot of these old uh, computers did. As I've mentioned before, due to the uh, fire, uh, flame retardant uh, bromide uh, used in the plastics, um, you can actually get a chemical and a process to get rid of that if you want. But here it is, folks. Ta-da! State of the art from 25 years ago. Very popular, incredibly popular uh, personal computer. One of the most popular of all time. The Amiga 500. Many millions of these suckers sold. 512k of RAM, which was uh, pretty huge back then. This is almost a follow-up to essentially the uh, Commodore 64, although there was an Amiga 1000 a couple of years before this, but uh, really that was like a big box, you know, type one. So this all-in-one uh, keyboard unit, very, you know, kind of reminiscent of the Commodore 64. So it is a bit of a successor in that respect. So. Uh, 68,000 processor, very common processor used back in those days, just a shade over 7 megahertz or so, of course came in PAL and NTSC uh, standards, as all computers of the day did. This one obviously comes from Australia, so it's going to be a uh, PAL one. We have built-in floppy disk drive, which uh, is actually uh, completely a three and a half inch floppy disk drive, by the way, folks. Uh, not that five and a quarter rubbish, this is state of the art, of course for 1987 and uh, it can read and write IBM disks and Mac disks and all sorts of stuff because it's fully programmable apparently so the controller isn't uh, fixed to one particular type of uh, format disk and of course it had the separate numeric keypad separate cursor keys that was a huge thing back in those days actually to you know very professional Ooh, if you had a separate numeric keypad wow let alone separate cursor keys well, playing with the big fellas, the IBM. Now we've got two uh, nine-pin uh, joystick interfaces, left and right audio. It actually had uh, four-channel audio, 8-bit um, audio at, I think, 20-something kilohertz um, sample rate. So it had four independent uh, PWM uh, channels, so quite advanced audio capability for its day. Disk drive interface, serial port interface, yeah, the big 25-way one and a uh, parallel port as well. The power, unfortunately I don't have the uh, power adapters uh, for it, but uh, maybe we'll be able to power it up with a bench supply, see if it works. RGB video output and also a composite uh, mono monochrome output as well. On the bottom though, we have um, an expansion um, slot down here, um, uh, affectionately known as the uh, trap door, I believe, by the uh, Mega 500 aficionados. And let's take a look at this sucker here, it's the Commodore Amiga 500. Serial number 72997, I have no idea if that one's uh, what date or uh, you know, if that's uh, fairly old or whatever, but there you go. Attempted repair by unauthorized persons, voids warranty. <laughs> We're gonna screw that, that's for sure. And I think there is a screw under there. It's Gonski. Oh, I thought that was a screw under there. I don't think it is, no. It's not. Ah. And on the opposite side of the floppy under this uh, little cover here, we've got a big expansion header. And I believe uh, you could get uh, processor expansions and all sorts of uh, stuff for this one. So uh, quite a flexible expansion slot. And if we lift up the trap door, as they call it, that, folks, is incredibly disappointing. We have 
what looks like she oh no, no it, it is a module look at that i thought it was a how does that come out i don't know it looks like there's a pin header down this side oh all the amiga 500 aficionados are probably screaming at me aha it does slide out folks there you go Ta-da! what's under there i wonder i don't know let's crack that open first it's actually soldered uh is that salt? Yeah, it's soldered completely through. Hmm. Time to stoke up the iron. So we'll just rip this open. They were pretty serious about shielding on this. So let's just... Woo! Oh yeah, it's got that old smell. You better believe it. Woohoo! There we go. We're up. Smoking. Hope that doesn't set off the building uh, smoke alarm. That'd be embarrassing. Oof. The old solder smell. Ah, classic. My uh, JBC iron has no problems with thermal capacity on that huge uh, bit of metal shielding, by the way. Not a problem whatsoever. I've only got my iron set for like 300 there, and it's just ripping through that. Not a problem. Oh, look at that. We have some dip packages. And uh, I wonder what it is. I'm sure you, all your Mega 500 aficionados know instantly, but I don't. Is it RAM expansion? Probably. And well, no surprises whatsoever. It is a memory expansion card. 512k RAM. So this is a 1 meg Amiga 500. Ooh. And we've got our, ourselves a real time clock down here. There we go, it's an oaky part. There's our 32.768 kilohertz watch crystal. There's a little tweaking cap there. And our backup battery has, oh, I don't know, starting to get a bit crusty. And there's the money shot for you retro fans. Ha oh, ha, Texas Instruments TMS 4256 150 nanosecond uh, DRAM. Woohoo, 256k bit unbelievable so obviously we need uh, 16 of these chips to give us 512 megabytes and that's exactly what we get and check out the date code 31st week 1987 so yeah um this could be one of the very early units we'll uh, be able to see this a bit more when we open the main board uh see what all the date codes on there it could have been you know old stock uh ram or something like that when they assembled it but you know back in the day i don't know these things were, you know, usually pretty high turnover, so, yep, we might have a 1987 vintage first year unit here, folks. And we have ourselves a Rev 5 board, though, so, yep, your guess is as good as mine. And yes, assembled in Hong Kong, as were all uh, low-priced, dubious products back in the mid-80s. And as everyone knows, what are you talking about, Doc? All the best stuff's made in Japan. And we have a confirmation date on the PCB as well, 29th week 87. That would have been the uh, bareboard PCB manufacturer putting that date on there, most likely. Now as for the main unit, we have a combination of Torx bits and Phillips. So, I'm not sure what's going on here. There's a couple missing, so someone's had a, someone's probably had a hack at this. I'm not sure if all of them have to come out i'm assuming i mean this is holding down some sort of no that seems to be holding down some sort of extra metal thing in there this is a much deeper screw here so i'm going to assume they only have one over there it's kind of weird uh, and there's a couple of torques along the top here so i'm not yeah they all look matched so they're probably original so maybe these phillips ones actually are holding down something else in there which we'll we might find out yeah okay yep looks like the top cover is probably going to lift off i think yes oh it's a bit crusty Ta -da. Oh, look at that and here's our keyboard controller. Check it out. We've got a uh, 6570-036 from Moss. That is, um, oh, I googled it quickly, Amiga 500 keyboard controller. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for that. Woohoo, folks! 
Seven triple five timer. Awesome. Old school. Brilliant. Seven four LS uh, 123 and a seven four LS 27. And then we've got our two LEDs over here, which are quite an unusual package, actually. Oh, man. Check out the PCB, folks. Look at this. Um, a double-sided board, but non-plated through to save cost. Look, so they've got the jumper links on here like this, and then uh, soldered on the top side where it needs to be. Oh, man. Really crusty Hong Kong 80s technology stuff. Blech. Yeah, this thing really is crusty, like it uh, did come out of a garage from... Uh, some 40 year old guy who's still living with his parents that's the kind of uh yeah you know what i'm talking about and it looks like shield here a few looks like the screws are missing so looks like we've got a tab under there let's lift that up but i reckon somebody's had a crack at this and they haven't bastards haven't replaced the uh, screws how dare they another one there we go our shield should now, hopefully, lift up. Come on. Ta-da! Got it. We're in. And here we go. Single board construction, all through hole, of course. All the main chips are socketed all around here. And, uh, of course, they have the famous uh, names on them. We've got a Fat Agnes, we've got a Paula, we've got a Gary, we've got a Denise up here. They're the uh, custom uh, Amiga ASIC chips, which were given uh, these names. They stand for various things, all done by MOS technology as well. Uh, same as before, 68,000 processor, we've got 512K of RAM uh, down here. And uh, we've got some audio filter stuff around here. We've got all sorts of EMI stuff up the top, which we'll take a look at. Power in, there's really nothing uh, in the power side of things that comes straight from the external power adapter, like straight in there. There's no uh, switch mode stuff, no nothing. So the external linear power supply makes it all easy. And we've got an interesting looking uh, hybrid up there. And our floppy, maybe there's some extra circuitry under there as well. We'll whip the floppy out and we'll take a look some of this in more detail. Check it out, folks. That uh, 40 year old guy in his parents' garage really uh, is a bit of a doofus because look what he's done when he's put the floppy cable back in here. He's uh, missed a couple of the pins on there. Whoops, maybe that's why one of these units doesn't work. We've got ourselves a Rev 5 board here. Silk screen date code by the looks of it, uh, 13th week 88. Um, so there you go, that one could actually date it to early 88, and of course uh, the famous uh, internal code name for the Amiga 500 is the Rock Lobster. And of course B-52s, you young whippersnappers wouldn't know who the B-52s are or uh, how Rock Lobster associates to them. I will leave that up to you to Google it. And woohoo, some really advanced audio filter in here folks, TL084 quad op amp and some RCs. And yes, folks, we have genuine Foxconn connectors. And yes, that is the same Foxconn you've heard of these days in association with Apple, slave labor, and suicides. If you believe all the stories. Hmm, yes, they started out uh, manufacturing uh, components, most notably connectors. No wonder the thing was sold as not working. All four of these ASICs here mounted in the sockets upside down. All the electrons are gonna fall out. Jeez! And here's our first uh, ASIC we'll take a look at, which is Denise. And the first ASIC we'll look at here is Denise. And uh, Denise actually stands for Display Enabler. And this is actually the uh, Display ASIC controller, uh, capable of um, famously uh, locking onto uh, and syncing to external video signals. So you could buy an external uh, Genlock adapter to overlay video on an uh, external uh, signal. Very popular use for the Amiga 500 back in its day. And uh, Denise actually does a whole bunch of, you know, all the video timing, all the uh, planes and bit planes and stuff like that, and all the uh, the ham, the hold and modify um, uh, operations, which all the Amiga 500 people will know all what I'm talking about. If you don't, ah, uh, there's plenty of info out there on it, but there you go, full ASIC manufactured by Moss Technology. And uh, we have a date code there of 0688. 
and there it is the right way up so the electrons don't fall out and uh, we've got ourselves an interesting uh, single in line package or SIP package uh, ceramic hybrid here and that would be um, a white uh, ceramic uh, substrate on there and it looks like they've got a whole bunch of uh, passives or uh, chips or something on there, it's um, of course uh, like a conformally type coated with this uh, black stuff to actually uh, protect it. But yeah, some sort of ceramic hybrid. Not sure why they needed to go to that effort. If anyone knows, eh, post it in the comments. And of course this thing had uh, state-of-the-art graphics for its day, normally uh, 640 by 320 uh, graphics if you didn't uh, overscan the thing. There were various uh, techniques available to actually get higher um, in interlace mode and things to get uh, higher resolution on this thing. And it could have up to uh, 4096 uh, colours if you used uh, various special modes and things, but usually you couldn't achieve that in uh, uh, you know fast-moving graphics and games. But Pretty advanced video technology for its day, let me tell you. And I have no idea what this means. Fab 312512, or 512, obviously 512K Amiga, I'm assuming, but uh, some sort of fab plant uh, fabrication number? I don't know. Anyway, here we have Paula, which is our audio controller. And Paula stands for, well, Ports Audio and UART. And, uh, and by coincidence, apparently, it was also the uh, girl name of the chip designer's girlfriend. <laughs> Go figure. Wonder if they're still together. Does anyone know? Get the gossip. Come on. We need it. And this actually contains uh, four 8-bit uh, PWM channels up to 29 kilohertz uh, sample frequency. So, you know, quite versatile uh, for its time, really, and also handles the UART uh, interface and stuff like that. Hence its location here. Like, if you, if it was just purely dedicated to the audio, you would think, well, why is it sort of, you know, here? Why isn't it sort of over here, right over near the uh, audio and the audio output stuff over here? Well, it also controls the uh, UART stuff up here. So I guess it wasn't really needed to put it right over there. And also, of course, when you're talking about laying out uh, a board like this, by the way, which is a uh, two-layer board. I mean, you know, we've got our processor down here, which you'll look at, but you can see all the tracks snaking around, and then these ones from uh, Fat Agnes here up to Paula. And really, you know, you can't just whack this chip all the way over there, get those big 8-bit or 16-bit uh, uh, data buses all the way over here and stuff like that, and back here, and ah, uh, it's just not going to happen. So there's certainly a bit of art to sort of laying out a double-sided uh, board like this, really, because, you know, all the memory, of course, has to be in line. You can't just whack the chips anywhere you like. Um, of course, near the I.O. here, we've got our output um, uh, so 74F uh, series chips. I'm not sure, latching or whatever, buffering or whatever they're doing. Right near there, we've got our data flowing out from these uh, 244 latches, uh, buffers, right down into here, LS373s, and it all just, you know, flows nicely. It comes from the processor over to the ROM. The ROM is, of course, linked very close to the processor. Fat Agnes here, one of the main controllers, sort of right in the guts of that, going down, controlling the memory and all that sort of stuff, going and, of course, interfacing to uh, the sound and UART uh, chip. Paula, going over to Gary here, and it all just flows nicely. There's a lot of art to get in. A layer, a double-sided layout like this. Anyway, getting back to Paula here. Paula not only handles the uh, four-channel PWM audio, as I said, handles the UARTs, handles interrupts, handles the joysticks, um, all that sort of, uh, you know, external I.O. stuff. Now, all these ASICs here uh, originally stem from what's, what's called the uh, OCS, or Original Amiga uh, chipset. But this one is actually the, uh, I believe it's the Enhanced uh, chipset because... Down here, we have Fat Agnes instead of regular Agnes used in the original chipset. And here's Fat Agnes in an 84-pin PLCC. The original version of Agnes was in a 48-pin uh, uh, dip package, but uh, the uh, later versions, the fat ones, big, chunky 84-pin PLCC, the biggest pin count device on this board by far. And it handles um, all of the memory uh, interfacing, handles up to, uh, this one handles up to one uh, meg, so hence you can see it's coupled down here into the DRAM. So effectively, this is the uh, DMA, the Direct Memory uh, Access Controller down here. Um, it also contains some of the video stuff like the uh, Blitter interface and uh, things like that. So 
really critical chip in the entire Amiga 500 design and one of the main uh, things responsible for its excellent performance for the day. And all of the timing in this thing was actually um, all built around essentially the uh, video mode you're in and the essential video timings. Because back then, you know, video dictated um, you know pretty much everything in terms of the uh, uh, the way these uh, computers were designed and operated from a hardware architecture point of view. So effectively what the uh, video blitter inside this thing can do was uh, transfer stuff in memory without uh, hogging up the CPU basically. So it sort of you know took a lot of the uh, video processing uh, away from the main CPU and really even though this is a pretty powerful you know 68,000 um, processor for its day, you know 7 megahertz, eh, if you want a lot of high-end graphics you can just bog the whole thing down just bloody refreshing stuff. So really um, that's what this uh, direct memory access controller and the blitter engine inside this thing was able to do offload a lot of the grunt work from the main processor. And it could also do things like uh, draw lines as well. So effectively a very, you know, a very early uh, version of the, uh, you know, the real high-end video processors that you get these days, which can, you know, decode video in real time without any CPU and all that sort of stuff. This one could uh, draw lines and hence it could uh, use a few tricks to draw polygons and stuff like that, all without the uh, CPU, all of that um, complexity and those algorithms would be handled inside the video processor, essentially. Now another uh, subcomponent in this makes for interesting reading. It's called uh, copper, and it's basically a, um, a essentially an independent uh, finite uh, state machine inside this thing that allows you to uh, change video modes and all sorts of stuff on any point on the screen at any time. So really the Amiga 500 was very flexible in terms of uh, you know just displaying pretty much essentially anything you wanted on the screen, including different resolutions and different modes on the one screen at once. It's crazy, but very advanced video technology for the day. And of course, here we have the classic uh, 68000 processor manufactured by Signetics. Go figure, date code 8745, uh, but some of the chips on here are of course some um, 88. So this unit appears to be a uh, sort of early 1988 uh, vintage machine. Anyway, and, um, and we have our ROM, of course, which is a mask ROM. And it's, you know, Commodore uh, labelled. None of this EEPROM rubbish. No. Mask all the way. We've got one! Yes, folks, a triple five timer. Brings a tear to the eye. Ah. <sighs> and here's the only guy in the group. We have Gary. G'day, Gary. How you doing, mate? No worries. And Gary stands for Gator Ray, and it, there's just uh, glue logic and uh, bus control and uh, stuff like that. So and floppy disk control, things like that. Just some general housekeeping stuff. It is not considered part of the Amiga chipset. And there's an 8520 CIA or complex interface adapter. This one's called the Even CIA, and uh, this one handles uh, floppy control, serial, and uh, some of the parallel stuff. And the other one over here, the Odd. CIA that handles the uh, parallel port, the keyboard, and some of the floppy and mouse stuff. And as far as the power supply goes, as I said at the start, um, all we got is a common mode uh, choke here. It's an external linear uh, supply, plus 5 volts and uh, plus and minus 12 volts, and that's it. So there's no switching circuitry, no other stuff. Doesn't look like there's any uh, fuse protection or uh, anything in here. So, yeah, that's what you get when you use external linear supplies. Easy. And you'll notice quite a bit of EMI stuff around here on the external porch. You'll notice all those uh, ceramic caps there. And over here you'll start noticing some uh, ferrite beads. There we go. All for uh, external EMI. Even at, you know, back in the old days, still important, even at those low frequencies. And I just peeled off a label there, and here we have our artwork number uh, 312. 513, which we saw on the silk screen uh, back over there, and assembly number 312510. So there you go, Rev 5 board, and it's been burned in. And somebody's left their little mark. I burnt that in, in the Hong Kong factory, back in 1988. Woohoo! Claim to fame. And here we have our main processor, and that's uh, 28.37516 megahertz. Of course, you divide that by four, 
bingo, we get our processor clock as 7.09379 megahertz. Screaming. But you can see a bodge resistor down in the corner down there. There we go, lovely little bodge. We've got a uh, insulating sheet on here, of course, just to uh, make sure nothing shorts out. But apart from that, I can't see any other bodges on the bottom of this board. And check out the uh, solder mask back in the day, folks. I mean, here's the fiberglass down here, nice and smooth. And of course, we've got our uh, copper. This is uh, our gold-plated um, pins on our edge connector here. But look at that solder mask. It really is quite rough. Have a listen to that. And if you rub your fingers over that, you can really feel how uh, incredibly rough it is. If you know what uh, type of solder mask sort of or coating they were using back in those days, please let us all know. Fascinating stuff. Really different. You don't see it these days. I actually decided to take the uh, complete board out here so I could solder some wires onto that uh, DIN connector on the back. Make sure I get a good connection. And you can see... Uh, some of the layout here, it really is quite nice. Of course, being a double-sided uh, layout, they've got uh, predominantly the bottom side of the board, of course, running horizontal like this, and the top side of the board running traces uh, vertically. That's how they've done most of it. You can see uh, quite some beautiful uh, layout work down in here over to the connector flowing through and down to the main uh, ASIC chip here. The processor tied very, uh, uh, coupled very directly into the uh, expansion bus over here with no no protection resistors nothing just bang straight onto the processor and of course further down here you don't have uh, much space to especially when you're putting a couple of big fat power traces down in here to run these uh, uh, traces between all of your uh, 40 big 40 pin uh, dip chips down in here so you know it really is that's just like completely devoted to horizontal layout there almost no vertical and the exception to this uh, bottom horizontal rule, they've done that uh, up here on the memory chips. You can see that uh, it's effectively uh, just ground and a couple of vertical traces running through here, whereas most of the other uh, processor down in here is all horizontal and all the ASIC stuff. And then on the top side, there, instead of vertical for most of the other stuff on the board here, all your RAM runs horizontal. And check this out, folks. Look at that broken joints on the DIN connector down here. Look at it. See those? Just popping straight through. So even if I did the, have the uh, power adapter, would have been that uh, completely intermittent operation. Ah, oh, classic. Look at that. Just too much stress on that uh, DIN connector there. I'm just wiggling it with my finger there. You can see those joints just popped straight out of that sucker. Gonski. Maybe that's why this one doesn't work. And of course, that's a classic case of what happens when you get a connector like this. And yeah, there's effectively very little uh, strain relief on it. There's one, it looks like, shield um, pad down in here for that. But it's not taking any of the weight whatsoever. So all of, you know, every time you plug in that cable, someone's putting a lot of pressure on that to plug in the power cable on this thing and pull it back out by the cable and wiggle it around and it's putting all the stress on those solder joints and that's what happens. So there you have it, no uh, real surprises on this thing really. Um, it leveraged uh, existing Amiga uh, technology they developed for the Amiga uh, 1000 in terms of all of the uh, chipset uh, ASICs. They alone would have taken a, you know, a hell of a lot of work. So if you've got any uh, info on who worked on it, how many people worked on uh, these um, ASIC chipsets of the day, process technology, all that sort of thing, um, by all means, uh, leave a note in the comments or uh, discuss it on the EV blog forum. So, there you go. 25-year-old state-of-the-art technology. Smells 25 years old, too, let me tell you, folks. So, there's only one thing left to do. Uh, try and power this turd up. Well, I don't have the original adapter, so we'll just uh, shove a couple of prongs up its backside and see what happens. No wait. We have a bonus Amiga 500 mouse. Beautiful. Made in Malaysia. Oh, not in Hong Kong. What a letdown. The old fashioned ball type. Beauty. Ha, ah, check it out. Folks, all we have is a Hitachi, um, well, it's got a HA17339, but that's actually just an LM17339. 
339 quad comparator. And that's it. It's just getting the optical uh, outputs and feeding them uh, you know, through the comparators directly back to the, uh, well, the uh, not the processor, but the uh, uh, controller which handles the mouse. And that's it. Man, ancient. Manufactured by Mitsumi. And there we have our diode and photo transistor combo and our wheel, of course, with the obligatory uh, slots cut in there to uh, get a pulse every time it moves and the obligatory hair still in there. 1988 vintage hair? All right, let's power this turd up. I've got uh, the four wires running out, ground, uh, 5 volts and plus minus uh, 12 volts. I've hooked them up to my... Uh, a10 power supply and yes everyone keeps asking yes i will do a uh, review and a teardown of this thing um really annoying user interface by the way but it does seem to uh, actually work anyway um yeah i got uh, five volts and uh, plus minus 12 volts out of this sucker so programmed in so let's power it up shall we we can turn on all the outputs at uh, once by, or you can turn them on individually by uh, dicking around with the user interface. Really annoying, but power on. And there we go. We're drawing uh, one amp, just over an amp on the uh, 5 volt rail. Uh, 0.7 amps on the plus 12, and the positive and the top one is actually minus 12. I've got it uh, configured for minus here. Um, is drawing nothing, bugger all, because that's uh, just for the uh, serial interface I'm sure and our red power LED over here is on so I assume those are normal power consumption figures but unfortunately I get nothing on the monitor actually I am getting something on the monitor here this is just a really old crusty uh, Digitor uh, uh, brand uh, you know rebadged crappy Ola uh, TV and I can actually see the shape of a disc on there um, I don't think it's anything to do with the uh, Amiga. I think this piece of crap has uh, failed on me. So let me dig around for a bit. Yeah, it's gone, ski folks. I uh, like I call up the men like it's not just the video. I disconnect the video and everything, and the menu, um, nothing's showing up. So it looks like the backlight um, on the thing has died. And watch this. I think I can get it to briefly. It should it does briefly come up? Watch this. And there we go. You saw it briefly, uh, there we go, it briefly popped up, so, yeah. Piece of crap. Well, let's not muck around. This monitor will surely work, and it does. Ta-da! There we go, we have uh, some sort of boot screen, version 1.2, Amiga Workbench. So, presumably, we need the Amiga Workbench disc. Um, I thought it'd be built into ROM, but, hmm... Well, thankfully, it did come with a, a huge bunch of discs, and uh, I do have the Amiga 500 Workbench International and the uh, Extras and Basic disc for the 500 slash 2000. Let's give it a try. Well, no, that's a fail, I'm afraid. Uh, it's not doing anything, and I don't hear any floppy drive noises. Bummer. All right, I've taken the other uh, Amiga 500 apart that I've got, and uh, as you can see, the main board is actually um, uh, like a gold-coloured uh, uh, or a clear uh, solder mask, so you can see the uh, copper uh, through it. Now, it's different to the uh, slightly green tinge we had on the other board. Now, it's exactly the same uh, Rev5 uh, board, though. A few uh, component differences, like uh, a few uh, capacitor brand differences and uh, stuff like that. And um, we have a different uh, board in here. It looks like we have a small memory board with a uh, real-time uh, clock in it, so uh, I'm not sure about the uh, capacity of that one. It's not uh, marked at all, but the floppy drive is different. It's only got a uh, two-way cable on it. Here's the one out of the other one. It's actually got a four-way cable here, whereas this one's only got a two-way cable. So anyway, I'm just going to whip the floppy drive out of this one, put it into the other working machine, and hopefully uh, we can get it to boot. Yes, folks, I think we're in. I put it in. Floppy drives sound good. It's loading. Sam's workbench disc. <laughs> Somebody's uh, personalized it. Release 1.3, Super version 34.4, copyright 8586, Amiga Corp. There we go. So, yeah, there was something wrong with the uh, floppy drive, and it seems to be loading this original disc. 
no problems at all. Sam's workbench disc. He's, uh, whoever Sam is, I don't know, is this normal? Um, has he modified it for his own use? There we go, mouse works. Not a problem. <laughs> it's taken a while to boot, but uh, this thing works absolutely perfectly, even after, what, uh, 25 years. The floppy drive still works and the disc still works. Workbench release 1.2, 297, 360, free memory because I haven't installed the memory module. Um, and we're in Sam's workbench. That's pretty bland. So here we go. I have no idea how to use this thing, but let's click on Sam's workbench. Can we? No, left, right, no, single click. Oh, there we go. Where we've opened Sam's shell utilities, preferences, system, trash can. Man, it's really, really clunky. All the Amiga people are probably screaming at me because they have no idea what I'm doing. Can we drag the window? No, here we go. Can we drag that? Yes, we can. Oh, look at this state of the art, folks. Absolutely state of the art stuff. Titles, preferences, system. Let's go into system. Little drawer opens there. How do I open that? Yeah, thanks. Oh, double click. Okay. Format, CLI, init printer, disk copy, fast mem first. Whoa, we've got the command line interface. Sorry, folks, I don't know any of the command line stuff. What have we got in the utilities? It's really, ah, it's quite quirky to open this thing. Can't open utilities. No idea what's working. Okay, now let's see what happens to the current drawer when I insert a disk. I assume it will auto detect. And here we go. Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah, the 5 volt rail. It looks like it's only using, well, it's, it is only using the 5 volt rail. I can see because it, it only had those two wires, the uh, uh, red and the black, coming from the 5 volt there. So, yep, it just jumped up when it uh, spun up the motor there. But apart from that, it just drops back. All right, let's try and run 688 attack sub. Yeah. And it turns out if you right click on the uh, mouse here, it gives you... Uh, these menus here for disk and workbench open. There we go. All right, those are the files on the disk, and I'm running now 688 attack sub. Zzz. It's sleeping. No, here we go. We're going to run it. Unfortunately, it's only in mono. Hey, I can see myself. It's only in mono, folks. So, uh,. We would need, whoa, look at that. Come on, load up, load up. The power LED's flashing, is that normal? Ah, oh, software fire, press left mouse button to continue, guru. <laughs> Meditation, I love it. Press left mouse button to continue, all right. Well, something, something happened there, folks. I'm not sure what. Megados still executing. Maybe it uh, there was a read error on that disk or something like that. Yeah, that five volt rail draws just over two amps, two point one amps when it's uh, reading from the disk. There we go. No, we're in six eighty eight attack sub. Good on you, John W. Ratcliffe. Wonder what he's doing these days. If anyone knows, leave a comment. Press the key to begin mission selection. I just pressed a key. Oh, there we go. All right. Torpex 89. Work, you bastard. No. Oh, you got to put right. Can't use the mouse. I think you have to press the number keys. Oh, how archaic. There we go. Number one. And enter. Ta da. <laughs> Begin game. Yes, please. Wow. So archaic. Oh, look at this. We're on the sub, folks. Fantastic. Look at the graphics. What's that, 320 by 200? Oh, well, that was so exciting. I'm going internally berserk. I don't know about you, but I really don't miss the uh, days of these old uh, PCs, really. They're just 
pretty awful. I mean, yeah, nostalgia value, but apart from that, ugh. Anyway, it's amazing that this thing still worked. There you go, I had to, uh, don't know what's wrong with the floppy drive. Ah, uh, don't think I'm going to bother. Um, at least I do have one working uh, machine here, and I can't believe it read those three and a half inch floppy drives after, you know, 25 years. Amazing. You know, not a single byte out of order. It loaded up the workbench. Don't know how to use this bloody thing, but it worked. Amazing. So, hope you enjoyed that uh, uh, trip down memory vintage retro lane there. And if you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. And if you like Teardown Tuesday and these vintage teardowns, please give it a big thumbs up. Catch you next time.